The earth is filled with many forms of animal life. Of all these forms, the insects are the most numerous. Insects, by their pollinating activities, make possible the growth of an orange tree, a rose, a pea, clover, and cotton. They provide us with honey, beeswax, and silk. They are a food for many kinds of birds and fish. The world could not exist in its present form without them. While insects are necessary and valuable in maintaining the natural world as we know it, certain insects are harmful to man. the food crop he has planted and the forest he wishes to grow. They carry and spread disease, endangering man's health and the health of his domestic animals. When this happens, the insect becomes a pest, a threat to man. For many thousands of years, man's only defense against the pest insect was hand-picking it from the plant or making attempts to drive it away. For hundreds of years, ignorance permitted deadly epidemics of insect-borne diseases to ravage human populations. But as time passed, man's knowledge of the life cycle of insects increased. He was sometimes able to time his planting or harvesting to avoid a pest. By discovering their breeding places, he was able to destroy them. But more effective and reliable controls were needed. During World War II, the chemical compound DDT was discovered to have the capability of killing insects. It revolutionized man's ability to control pests. DDT prevented typhus epidemics in Europe and was used extensively in the destruction of the malaria-carrying mosquitoes in the tropics. But DDT was not the final solution to the pest problem. With a steady rise since World War II in the application of pesticides to the environment has come the growing realization that they can be dangerous, not only to the insect they are meant to destroy, but to birds, fish, and other forms of life, including man. Extensive study of the effects of DDT has alerted us to the dangers of the widespread application of poisonous substances to the environment. But the need to control injurious insects remains. The question arises, how can we prevent pest insects from doing harm to us, and at the same time, how do we not harm ourselves and those animal species we need? One answer is biological control or the development and use of non-chemical means to control harmful insects. Work being done with the gypsy moth illustrates the different approaches to non-chemical insect control now being investigated. The gypsy moth is a forest defoliating insect. It was first brought to this country in 1869 by a naturalist who wished to develop a silkworm hardy enough to survive the New England winters. The moth escaped from his laboratory and because it had no natural enemies in its new environment, soon multiplied and spread, causing extensive damage to the forests of the northeastern United States. A variety of steps taken to destroy or halt the spread of the moth over the past century have failed. The young gypsy moth caterpillar hatches in the late spring. It grows rapidly, feeding on a great variety of leaves. 
This is the gypsy moth's troublesome stage, when it actually defoliates large areas of woodland. Attempt to halt the destructive insect, scientists are now investigating non-chemical means of bringing it into balance with its environment. Research efforts began in the laboratory. Gypsy moth eggs are collected in the forest and brought to the laboratory to be reared. This beginning is the most critical part of the biological control research program. A continuous supply of healthy insects for use in the experiments being conducted is assured. One possible way of controlling harmful insects is by spreading disease among them. Entomologists have discovered two microorganisms that are fatal to the gypsy moth, a virus and a bacterium. When fed to the moth larvae in the laboratory, they cause the larvae to die. But the laboratory is one thing, the field quite another. To be effective, the virus and bacterium must work in the forest. Scientists set up experimental plots in areas infested with gypsy moths. As an example of the problems faced in the forest, the researchers knew that even the best spraying methods could not cover every leaf of every tree. Because the moth larvae could not be controlled unless they ate the virus or bacterium, Entomologists designed a feeding preference experiment to discover if the insect could sense the presence of the sprayed material on the leaf. The results of the experiment would be used as a guide in preparing the spray to be used in the forest. Scientists also discovered that the virus was destroyed when exposed to the rays of the sun. A material had to be found that would protect the sprayed virus. In another experiment, researchers mixed the virus with many different liquids and sprayed the mixture in the forest. After spraying, leaves were collected and taken into the laboratory. 
there they were fed to the laboratory reared insects to see if the mixture was effective in protecting the virus from the sun's rays. The most effective mixture would be used in larger sprays. While research continues in this type of biological control of harmful insects, other approaches are being investigated. Entomologists now know that many kinds of insects are the natural enemies of other kinds. Insects do more to keep themselves under control than man could ever do. The use of natural insect enemies to control harmful insects is another aspect of biological control. A predator insect is one that devours its prey. A parasite lays its eggs inside another insect. The egg will hatch and the young insect will feed and grow inside its host. When it has grown, it will emerge, killing the host insect. To find out what parasites present in the forest will attack the gypsy moth, cages containing gypsy moth pupae, the last growth stage before the insect becomes an adult, are placed in the forest. By using this method, entomologists found that this small wasp-like insect was a parasite of the gypsy moth pupae. Research has indicated that it may, in sufficient numbers, be used in the control of the moth. Researchers continue to search the forest for more parasites and predators of the gypsy moth. They continue laboratory experiments to better understand the relationship between a parasite and the insect it will lay its eggs in. Another approach to non-chemical control of harmful insects is the idea that they may somehow be kept from reproducing. The female gypsy moth is a poor flyer. Weighted down by the unfertilized eggs she carries, she tends to stay in one place. To attract the male, she sends out a powerful odor. The male finds her and fertilizes the eggs. Scientists have learned how to manufacture the sex attractant of the moth. They have placed the attractant in traps to find out if they are able to catch the male before he finds the female. Forest entomologists also think that large amounts of the attractant sprayed by plane over a forest may confuse the male moth to such a point that he will be unable to find the female. It may work in two ways. By spraying a large amount of the attractant over an area, thus creating many attractive points, the male may be unable to pinpoint where the female is. Or by having to fly from point to point in his search, he may simply be worn out and stop searching. Prior to spraying, researchers place male and female moths who are ready to mate in the forest. After spraying, they locate the female and bring her and the egg she has laid back to the laboratory. They will then determine if the eggs have been fertilized and can judge the effectiveness of the sex attractant as a means of control.
Before we know whether or not any of these non-chemical control techniques will work against pest insects, more research is needed. But man, in turning to biological controls, takes his lesson from the natural world. By observing, seeking to understand, and utilizing its intricate system of checks and balances, we may achieve control over injurious insects without harming or destroying the other living creatures who share the earth.